Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor and the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Red Circle. Also, the Five Reasons YouTube channel. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, and turn the notifications on. Also, check us out on Off the Floor. That's our Discord, $2.99 per month. Got nine channels on there. We're considering adding a tenth. Talk about that more here as the episode uh, goes forward, but check it out again. This is where you can communicate with Heat fans all day and night long, and us. We pop on there with host updates. We also pop onto the various channels. So if you have questions, you get us answered directly from us. Check it out. It's off the floor. That's our new Discord. The link is posted right here on the podcast feed, the YouTube feed, and the top of the Five Reasons Twitter page. Also, check out the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. You break, we'll fix. That's with a U at the beginning. You break, we'll fix. It's Miami's premier wheel repair and refinishing company. 20 years of experience repairing and refinishing damaged wheels from curb rash, bends, and cracks. Juice up your car with a fresh look with custom powder coating colors to set you apart from the rest. You Break Wheel Fix is located in North Miami off of Biscayne and Northeast 143rd Street. Fast turnaround times minimize your car's downtime. Catch You Break Wheel Fix on all social media platforms or contact our guy Mark at 305-748-0112. That's 305-748-0112. One, two. And now, today's episode. Down to Biscay. Yay. Uh, five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck the say, you in trouble, y'all. Check the floor plan. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop with one hand. And Pat, we trust. It's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. Welcome back to Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick and at Five Reasons Sports. My lingering cold continues, so I apologize for my voice. we got Greg Sylvander. You can follow him at Greg Sylvander. And what we're going to do right now is set you up for what looks like the most important stage of the Miami Heat regular season. Uh, the Heat come into this point three games over 500. They've now won two in a row after losing seven in a row. So they've actually lost seven out of 10. They have beaten Sacramento and Washington during this recent stretch. The Sacramento win is a good win. Can't take anything away from that. The Washington win, everybody beats Washington. So I'm not going to put too much stock into that. It's pretty much Jimmy Butler who showed up and not a whole bunch of others. But now, the Miami Heat played 10 games before the end of February. Eight of those 10 games are against teams that have better net ratings than them. So they are 18th in the league in net rating coming into tonight's play. We're recording this on a Saturday. They've beaten very few teams so far this season with better net ratings. I actually counted seven wins. I may be off by one or two there, but there was the Cleveland win. There was the Golden State win, barely better than them uh, this year. The Sacramento win, we mentioned Philadelphia, but no Embiid. Um, They don't have a ton of signature wins. They haven't beaten Boston. They haven't beaten Milwaukee. They haven't played Denver yet. They're going to see them. They lost to OKC. They lost to Minnesota. So they kind of have the same problem the Dolphins had this year, where like they cleaned up against bad teams. Miami actually has put away most of the bad teams this year, but they have not really punched up uh, very well. And they're supposed to be one of those teams that other teams are punching up at. And instead, when you're 18th in the league out of 30 teams in net rating, you're not in a great spot. Um, And again, these next 10 games, they play eight of them. The only two that are not are the Spurs and the Blazers. They get the Spurs this week. They get the Blazers towards the end of the month, you would hope that they would get those, but they got to figure out a way to get three or four of the others. And the other part of this, Greg, and I know we're going to weave this in and we're going to do a lot more over the next few days, is this comes during a stretch where the trade deadline occurs and the all-star break. So all of these things are kind of coming together in February. The trade deadline is February 8th. They have three games before that. Conceivably, they could be 500. They could be six games over 500 by that point. And then they're going to have more decisions to make, and then they get a couple of days off, actually, which is nice, uh, before they play Boston, and we see if they get hammered again, and that's on Super Bowl Sunday. So I'll go to you with this. Um, What is the most important thing that they need to get out of this stretch? I mean, they basically need to ensure that they continue to have fun, and I'm going to really boil it down to that. 
uh, because you've seen the difference when this team isn't having fun and when they are, and and they can at least remain competitive. You need to get through the stretch above 500. I don't think you can backtrack in the standings. This is their moment where they actually, as they've now kind of um, gotten up off the mat from that seven-game losing streak, they actually have a chance to – not only jump Indiana in the standings, but also jump Philadelphia if Philly, if Philly starts, um, you know, losing and they could maybe catch up there. They're not that many games back in the loss column. That's kind of where you want to hope is to not be in the play in. And to me, this month of February is going to define whether you're playoff fodder um, in terms of being in the play in and having to fight for your life or if you're going to be able to rest through that stretch. So to me, I know that they have some cupcakes in March and Spolstra has classic uh, after all-star break runs in his history. So I don't want to discount what they may be able to do to rattle off victories later in the season. But I think what this stretch will show us is, are they ever going to be for real? Or is this going to be kind of a middling team all the way through to the end of the regular season? Well, yeah, they got three games against Detroit in March alone. So I, you know, this is, you know, that's an opportunity to just collect wins, you hope. Um, but we talk about them, you know, making up ground. I, I think at this point over the next 10, you're just hoping not to lose ground. You know, they've lost touch to a certain extent with the Knicks, uh, which was not supposed to happen. And now the Knicks are the Knicks have injuries. Like the Knicks are are thin, uh, but they've played so well since they've got an Anobi, it hasn't seemed to matter. And Cleveland, they really should have passed Cleveland. I mean, honestly, I mean, you look at Cleveland not having Garland and Mobley for a month or more. And in that case, it kind of thinned it out. We've talked about this with the Heat, that sometimes the Heat are better when they don't have a full roster. It seemed to clarify things for Cleveland quite a bit also, where it was really about Allen and, and Mitchell primarily. And they've run away from the Heat a little bit too. So you have those two teams that run away a little bit. You have Boston, you have Milwaukee. And then you have the Philadelphia question, which we're still waiting to hear what the results are with MB, but it doesn't sound good. So, I mean, like you said, they could move up and catch Philadelphia. I guess that's the one break that the Heat have caught. But as the Heat go into this, they're only three games ahead of Chicago. I mean, like they're they're closer to teams that we thought would start to sell off and tank than they are to the best teams in the Eastern Conference. And, you know, that's why I say, like, you just can't lose more ground. Like you have to uh, six and four in these next 10. I would take that. Honestly, you know, you win the two you're supposed to win and you split the other eight and they're going to have a hard time doing it. And again, I'm going to go through it, you know, specifically we've, we've talked about it uh, in the abstract here, Clippers at home. The heat haven't played well against the Clippers in years. Not when the Clippers are healthy, excuse me, the magic at home. They have handled the magic a couple of times, so maybe that's one you get. We mentioned the Spurs. Clippers at home on Super Bowl Sunday again. I'm assuming the Celtics at home. I'm not expecting a lot there. They go to Milwaukee and Philadelphia on a back-to-back. This is where it gets you, ugly. Yeah, I mean, you could catch the Sixers there. Again, depending on Embiid's status, you did beat them without Embiid once already, but it is the second night of a back-to-back. I wouldn't put that in the win column necessarily. Um then you have All Star. Now we know that, for the with the exception of Bam and Hawkes, most of the team they're going to get a break there. But then they come out of the break with a, a tough trip. I mean, I it's, in New Orleans, yeah. that's a great place to go right out of an All Star break, right? I mean, you a team that's lethargic, they better fly in there than stay in their rooms that night. Uh, then they get a couple of nights off. I don't know if they would go back to South Florida. My guess is probably not. They'd probably fly out to California. And they get a back-to-back against the Kings and the Blazers. The Kings game, that's going to be tough uh, in that building, even with a couple days off. The Blazers, second night of a back-to-back, you hope you get it. But again, a game that you're hoping to get, but it's the second night of a back-to-back on the road with a three-hour time difference. So we don't know exactly how that's going to play out. And then you end the trip in Denver. Thanks. I mean, that's the worst. Right. I mean, that's the worst possible. I mean, honestly, Greg, I think you take it because they're going to lose that game anyway. Right. Yeah. Like uh-huh. we assume it. So might as well put that one at the end of a trip. Like I, it used to always be when I would travel with them, it felt like every single year they were finishing a five game West swing in Denver on the second night of a back to back after coming from LA. I, I can't tell you how many times I did that trip. It was always from the Clippers too. 
Uh, cause they used to do it where the Clippers and, and they wouldn't put the Clipper and Laker games on the same trip, which never made any sense to me. They started doing that the past couple of years, yep. but when we would fly into Denver. I would see Dwayne in the locker room and he would just like shake his head. Like he wasn't playing. Like we, we knew like, <laughs> last game of the trip, uh, you know, finishing it up in Denver with the altitude. So that's a loss, but that would have been a loss anyway. So actually you kind of take it, but I think to go six and four during that stretch is a challenge. It and is the way the Knicks and, and Cleveland's playing. Like I would just say, you're just hoping to stay within striking distance at that point. Now, let me ask you this, and then we'll pivot to more of this stuff after the break. Three games before the trade deadline. Okay. So those three games, how much do you think they'll dictate what they do at the mm. deadline? Clippers at home, I'm not expecting a win on Sunday. I've, I've seen them play the Clippers too many times. Magic at home, Spurs at home. If they go any worse than, than two and one. It'll okay? hurt. It'll hurt, um, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like they made their move, and I don't know that they're going to line up to make another one so quickly. Um, I've received no indication that they're close to anything either, so like, part of it is just if I'm going to go down this road, I'm speculating. Like, Maybe they decide that they're going to sell, sell Caleb, and when I say that, it would really be flipping him for another player maybe that they can still be functional with if they don't think they're going to pay him. But then there's a part of me that thinks, nope, that's not what the Heat do. <clears throat> they're going to hang on to Caleb for the rest of the season. So to that point, I think the Rogier move was made. I'm not expecting much, so I don't think that what's done now will dictate what they were going to do. I've said that I think that ultimately this is going to land in a place where they're going to ar arrive at this decision that they need to make major changes, but I don't think it's going to be at the deadline. I think that that's a summer conversation. And so that's just where I continue to stand. And I don't think what happens now and in these next couple games, like to, to think that you would make decisions based off of just these next couple games, that seems like a short sighted approach. And I don't think that that's the way that they operate. Well, I don't think winning three straight would necessarily lead them to do something. That's for sure. I think losing two or three of these next three could get you a pivot in the other direction. Honestly, like I, because I mean, yeah, again, the num the the numbers are the numbers. They made the Rosier move. I liked when they made it. I still like it. I think the shooting will come around. I don't think he's going to be a 48% shooter with the heat, but he's going to be better than he's been, which is about, excuse me, 32%. His overall floor game play, has been good. It's been good. So, so I think that, you know, there's something to build on there and you do have the full roster. So at least you get the opportunity to evaluate everybody. We've talked about how Hawk is and Duncan now Duncan being out with a concussion again, he's going to miss again, the game again on Sunday. The tape kind of receded a little bit here, and they need to figure out a way, I think, to get Hawkins and Duncan more involved as they go forward over the next month. Um, but I, I think that I think you're right that the, t the Terry move is is the move. But if I think if they lose the next three, I absolutely could see them make a move to go backwards a little bit in the perception of fans. Like I, I do think that you know then you you start to look at the Caleb thing and say okay. Well, you know, can we use the Caleb contract of what's left of it? Um, and I don't know if he's going to opt out or not, but I would anticipate even with the uneven year he's had that he will opt out of it because it's not a big number and he'll take his chances out there on the market and kind of see what happens. And it's a guy who's had really one contract in his career. So he's looking for a second one that was a little bit more lucrative. Um, and if you just get the feeling that it's not a direction you're going to go where you're going to resign him, then I could see them saying, okay, let's try to pick up another asset here for the future or let's try to get a little further under the tax or and, and i i don't know you know you know what i'm saying i i feel like that's i feel like if you have a bad three games here i feel like it moves more in that direction than it is right now i i I'm, i want to ask you and get your perspective on this um if they were to lose those games like you're mentioning if they were to trade Caleb, Thomas Bryant, and Drew Smith, they actually would slide, I think, completely out of the tax and they wouldn't be a tax paying team at all. And like, I hate to say it, but I wouldn't put that off the table either. You know what I mean? I think that it has to be explored at least. Can you get an asset back? 
I mean, I guess that's a question. Can can you get a second round pick back or something that can be flipped somewhere else? I mean, I that that's how I would judge it. If it's just if it's just to get out of the tax, I, I think it becomes, you know, sort of an open question about whether that's what you do now. But I feel like if if you if you get out of the tax and you get a small piece that can be included for something else later on, it can be justified. I'll just say it because I, I mean, let's be honest, this team has not performed. They've not performed. I mean, like we can. We can sugarcoat it. We can talk about all the injuries they've had. They've looked worse since everybody's come back. You can't say that a team that is 18th in the league in net rating is a contender. They're not. They're not. I mean, the only the only reason we're even suggesting they could be is because they did the same crap last year, and then they made a run from three minutes left in the second play-in game against a bad Chicago team yeah. and figured out and, – and Jimmy went nuclear against Milwaukee, right? Prior Completely to that, clear. you would never put them in that class, right? No, they were not. They didn't look like a contender all last year. They don't look. I like the roster better this year. I liked it better coming out of camp. And I like it even better now with Rosier in there for Lowry. Because Lowry was the big issue for me. But they haven't played like a contender the whole year. Like, they haven't beaten any. Like, again, we were critical. I know you follow the Dolphins. Obviously, I cover the Dolphins in some capacity still. People were saying this about the Dolphins the whole year. They had chances yep. to prove it over and over. They couldn't. Okay. They didn't beat Except the Cowboys game. But then that wasn't the a good win game. anymore. No. Right. They scored. They dropped 70 on Denver. And then that looked better in retrospect because yeah. the Broncos got their bleep together in the second half of the season. But when the Dolphins played Denver, they were a horrible team. You know, they got better as the year went on under Sean Payton. They didn't beat anybody. When, when push came to shove, Baltimore destroyed them. Buffalo destroyed them. I mean, that's just that's we've gotten used to seeing that, right? Like, and then Kansas City beat them. And the Heat, that's the reality. Now you can point back to say, well, the, the 2005, 2016 didn't beat anybody in the regular season. I remember writing many columns about that. And then they, you know, obviously then Dwayne went nuts in the playoffs. So again, if 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 Heat officials, if Heat fans, if Heat media want to kind of cling to some things they've seen in the past and say, okay, this team can replicate some of those things. I understand that. I mean, we, we go back and do historical precedent stuff here on the podcast all the time. But I'm just saying with what I've seen with my own eyes this year, yeah. their top three players have not fit. Okay. Bam is an all-star. He's not having a better year than last year, in my view. I think he's having a worse year than last year prior to the all-star break because Bam's slippage came after the all-star break last year. Jimmy has looked much better of late of late okay and jimmy's game picked up after the all-star break to make up for bam last year so maybe they will continue to be an upward trajectory but it, he has not been consistent with his effort we've talked about that at many times caleb has not had a great year as a role guy um josh has had a couple of offensive games has not been as good defensively as i think we hoped he would be and again Hawkes and duncan who were to me along with kevin love the real positive stories of the first 30 to 35 games love got it back together in the last game, but Duncan and Hawkes have not, or at least, you know, Duncan has not had the opportunity to with some of the, uh, the, the stuff he's been dealing with, particularly again, the concussion stuff. So, so they don't look like a contender to me. They just don't. I mean, they had an opportunity to prove it against Boston and we saw what happened in that game. They gave up like 150, right? So again, I'm not saying they can't do it, but I understand if the front office looks at it and says, all right, let's reposition a little bit. Yeah. Let's just reposition. Okay. They're not and, trading and, a first round pick. No, I know. And at this point you don't, I, I, I think again, you traded one for Rozier. I like the move and that's why I liked it better than trading, say two first round picks and Jovic for DeJounte Murray, which I don't think would have moved the needle enough to justify that. So to me, the hedge move on Rozier was the right move, and we'll see if it gives them a puncher's chance. All right, we're going to get to uh, the rest of the episode here in a second. Before we do, want to mention a couple of great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. Excuse me, our friends over at Better Edge. Use the code 5RSN. That's 5RSN. Get $20 to play. We've got a Super Bowl tournament going on right now. Join it because not only can you win the pot, this first place prizes, second place prizes, third place prizes, but I'm giving away T-shirts uh, just to random entries. You don't even have to win. Go to betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. 
get twenty dollars to play. You also get it with using the code Five Reasons, or just check out our Twitter page. I'm tweeting out the competition all the way up to the Super Bowl. Also, check out Prize Picks. Use the code Five F I V E. This is our fantasy partner. Our daily fantasy partner, use the code 5 F I V E. You get your initial deposit matched up to $100. Play the NBA, the NFL, and all the other sports pair athletes from different sports together. Go two, three, four, five, six players. Play the Goblins, play the Demons. They got all kinds of stuff over there. Prizepicks.com from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. But make sure you sign up. We know we've been telling you about a different code. We are only using this code now. Sign up with the code 5 F I V E. Win some money and additionally help us because uh, we have a long standing relationship with Prize Picks. This helps us keep the content coming. All right, so let's get to it. And I know this is what people really wanted. Your prediction for what we're, we're what, it, six days out now, five days out, trade deadline. What happens? They do anything? Um, today, so this is on February 3rd at 8 40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I say that we do not see them make any further moves. I that's where I stand today. I'll let you know if that changes every episode leading up to, but that's where I am right now. I feel like they made their move. <clears throat> um, I just if they were to trade Caleb, it would either be for an, a similarly expiring player that maybe fills a need in the front court in a different way, or it would be a player that's on a longer term contract. It may be a slightly lower number that you want to take a chance on, or it's going to just be straight selling him off for nothing into a team's cap space, for instance, or, you know, like that kind of situation, or he gets, you know, folded into a trade exception or something like that. And so those things are on the table, but I'm not expecting it. I'm going into the deadline expecting it to be pretty quiet from the Heat's perspective. Uh, do you – where where do you stand? I think the most likely scenario is they trade Drew Smith. I, I, I like I, And again, it's not going to count to most fans as a move, but there's a reason to do it, and I, I feel like that's the probable move here. I don't With see a, pick? a big move. Perhaps. Um, we'll oh. see. I mean, I, you know, uh, perhaps maybe a, well, with a second to kind of clean it up a little bit. I, that Something like that or Thomas Bryant. I think that's where we're at. I don't I don't think I know there's been talk about Dorian Finney Smith. Look, some of the talk here and I don't know if it's just there are certain teams are completely unreasonable, but some of the talk here about what teams are looking for or what they're using, you know, Woj and Shams for to get out there into the space like three first round picks for Dorian Finney Smith. The Nets turned down five first round picks reportedly for Mikel Bridges. I don't even know if I believe that story, but Me, U- Utah, uh, right? I mean, Utah, I mean, Danny Ainge, we know, asks for ridiculous things all the time. I, I just, because Olinix name has come up a bunch. I mean, I had a couple of people ask me, excuse me, about the Heat's interest in him today, but I, I just think the prices are high. I think the Heat got a good price for Terry Rozier. Like, I, I feel like first round pick and expiring contract for a guy who was averaging, I know it was on a bad team, but it was on pretty decent efficiency there. Averaging and those kind of numbers, was, that was good value for the Heat, I thought. And it opened up their taxpayer mid level exception. Like, they moved far enough away from the second apron to where they can spend that. It'll be prorated, but their taxpayer mid level in the buyout market. So that's where they can, can continue to be players. And I wanted to mention that because I've always been anti-buyout market because they've gotten so little production out of it throughout the years. We always make a big deal about the Troy Murphys of the world or was a Roni Turioff one year that they brought in and everything else. Um, but they did hit with Kevin Love last year. So, and I, and I think what we saw with the trade market starting early and so many teams, especially in the West, jostling for position and kind of seeing if they're contending or not, that I do think there will be more activity. And also when you look at the second apron uh, and the more punitive stuff is coming up down the road here. That also the cap uh, was down what a million dollars from what they anticipated. There's a whole bunch of things coming into play here, but I, I think ultimately what happens is there'll be more trades. I may be wrong about that, but I think there'll be more trades. I agree. And if there are more, tra- right. And, but uh, Greg, that's the thing though. If there are more trades, there will be more buyout candidates because typically in the recent years, the buyout candidates have been players like Kyle Lowry, obviously he's not come back to Miami, who have been traded to a team they can't help at that point, right? 
uh, and but they may be able to help somebody else. And so the more trades there are, the more buyout prospects there are going to be. Love was a different situation because that was more of a playing time issue and kind of them going a different direction. I still don't really understand why they cut him loose, but I think there's going to be options for the Heat there. So I, I think you can make the argument that they made their trade already. The team didn't respond the way you'd hoped, at least not at first. And you do have an otherwise healthy roster, okay, for the most part. Again, Duncan's situation will clear itself up. And essentially, you don't really have to do anything else. And you just wait to see if somebody comes open in the buyout market who's 6'8 or taller and can defend a little bit. And maybe somebody you could put out there with Bam in certain situations. But I, I don't think they're going to make a trade for a guy. And I'm told this all the time by folks in their front office. They, if they're going to add somebody, it's somebody that Eric Spolscher can potentially close important games with. That is their line. Okay. Terry Rozier fits that description. Yeah. They did not have a player like him to do the things that he can do, turn the corner, get in the paint, break down the defense, create for himself and other people. They did not have that guy. Kyle Lowry was not that guy. That is a useful skill set at the end of games. Okay. They won't add anybody who is just, you know, and trade another asset no. for a player who Eric is not like going to tap man. on the shoulder yeah. and close. No, they won't do it. They won't do it. It's going to have to be somebody who can crack their top seven at the end of games. So think in those terms. Now, I now look, Dorian Finney-Smith to me is the kind of player who might be able to. Would Royce O'Neal? I'm not sure. You take a look at some, uh, some of the guys around the league. I think use that as your line, and I think then maybe they consider something. But honestly, I think that the team – kind of made the decision for them. I mean, they lost seven straight and they looked awful during it. Like they lost oh, against the good teams. They got blown out and then the bad teams, they let them hang around long enough and lost to. So, yeah. you know, I, to me, the front office did their part. They got a guy in my view, below market value. Um, and I think that guy is going to help them not just this year, but into the future. And I think at this point you wait for the buyout market. I think that's the most likely scenario right now. Agreed. With that being said, don't aggregate me. They'll trade Tyler Hero and some kind of blockbuster, and everybody will say we're wrong. But I just, I don't think that's the direction that this is going. All right, for Greg, I'm choking. So I'm <laughs> going to end this here. Hopefully by tomorrow, I'll be able to talk to you guys uh, without all of this uh, stuff. Anyway, have a good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. After all, someone needs to listen to my dad.